University College of London and University College London Hospitals in London, UK. His research interests include the investigation of new therapeutic strategies and the assessment and prediction of outcomes in rheumatic diseases with a focus on new cities and spondyloarthritis. Mm -hmm. Recently, he has developed interest in COVID-19 and its impact on patients with rheumatic diseases. He is the chair of the EULA Standing Committee of Epidemiology and Health Services Research and a member of the EULA COVID-19 Database and COVID-19 Rheumatology Alliance Steering Committees. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It, it is a, a real pleasure to, to be here today. Uh, I will share. So, uh, Alain, you need to unshare yours. Yeah, okay. So hopefully you can see my slides. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yes. Uh, so again, thank you very much. It is a, indeed a real pleasure to be here today and to speak to you. And I, I hope you'll find the, the presentation informative. And I think we will have plenty of time for, for discussion at the end. And I look forward to that. Uh, so I'll speak about COVID-19 in the context of rheumatic diseases, um, and not only lupus, but I'll present data uh, of rheumatic diseases as a whole, because I think that data is also informative for patients with lupus. And to be honest, especially at the beginning, when, we, uh, we, when the, the numbers available in the literature were quite, quite small, it was impossible to analyze only patients with lupus. Uh, but many other patients take the same type of medications that lupus, patients with lupus take, uh, so I think this data uh, is informative. So um, as you all know, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented pressure on healthcare systems worldwide. And, uh, and it has caused a very large number, number of casualties at, at the global scale. And although the majority of cases are indeed asymptomatic or uncomplicated or, uh, uh, or they manifest mild or moderate illness. Uh, and this is, represents about 85% of the cases. There is indeed a group uh, that will suffer from severe COVID-19, maybe 10 to 15%, and that will require hospitalization and oxygen support. And unfortunately, there will be an even smaller group uh, with critical in illness and uh, that will eventually pass away. And this might represent around two or 3% of, of the patients, but obviously that percentage depends a lot on the underlying uh, risk factors and geographic location. And what characterizes severe COVID-19? Well, severe COVID-19 is characterized by uh, lung disease, uh, so pneumonia, so that's infection of the lungs. Acute respiratory distress syndrome, which again is a severe uh, uh, um, manifestation affecting the lungs. And then many other organs or systems can be affected, including the kidneys with acute kidney injury. There's an hypercoagulability state that can lead to thromboembolic uh, events like pulmonary embolism, like stroke. There can be uh, disseminated infections, like something called sepsis. And in a, in, a, in a subgroup of patients, it's something that we call an hyperinflammatory syndrome. Um, it's like the, the, the reaction of the body to the virus. It's actually more damaging than the, than the virus itself. There's an in, in hyperinflammatory state that is creative, and that hyperinflammatory response is even more damaging than the, the virus itself. And, and more recently, uh, a very specific type of uh, manifestation has emerged in children. Uh, it's called the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, and it resembles a certain type of vasculitis called Kawasaki disease. And it can be a severe manifestation in children. Having said this, uh, 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 primary infection with SARS-CoV-2 in children in the large, large, large majority of, of cases is a, is a benign disease. Uh, sorry about this. 
uh, uh, so this occurs only in a very small proportion of patients. Now, uh, I think it's important to make this remark because I, I often see the terms confused. So what is SARS-CoV-2 and what is COVID-19? So COVID-19 is the disease, while SARS-CoV-2, it's the actual, the actual virus that causes the disease. So SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. So it's the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 which stands for coronavirus disease 2019. And this is because the first cases were described in December 2019. So what are these viruses? So they belong to a, a large family of virus uh, that have RNA inside of them, uh, and therefore they're called RNA viruses. And they have these uh, crown-like spikes. You can see there the spike protein or the S protein. And, and they're called coronavirus because of these uh, spikes that resemble a, a crown. Um, and they can cause disease in animals and in humans. Now, uh, there are other coronaviruses that infect humans and that cause disease in humans. And in fact, there are seven. There are seven coronaviruses that have been described in humans. Four of them are uh, shown here on the top left. Uh, and that's human coronavirus uh, 229E, HKU1, NL63, and OC43. Now, these four coronavirus, they cause common colds. They cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract in infections. And they are the most common cause of respiratory tract infections throughout the world. So the coronavirus are in fact not new to us and they actually cause the majority of common colds throughout the world. Now, more recently, three uh, types of coronavirus have emerged that can cause severe disease, severe upper respiratory tract infection with potential multi-organ damage. The first one was described in November 2002. Uh, for the first time, it was described in, 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 in Foshan in China, and it caused severe acute respiratory syndrome. And uh, for two years, uh, 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 individuals with this condition were, uh, were detected. But after May 2004, no more cases of SARS-CoV-1 disease um, um, were reported. The second one is the MERS-CoV, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. It was reported for the first time in Jordan in April uh, 2012, and it still causes periodic endemics in the Middle East, but it's very much circumscribed to that area of the globe, and, and, and it only causes uh, periodic endemics. Uh, but it's something to uh, keep an eye on because uh, there's always the potential of the, this virus spreading to other areas, areas of the globe. And more recently, SARS-CoV-2, as you know, it was firstly described in the province of Wuhan in China in December 2019, and it's a currently ongoing pandemic. And before moving to uh, more specific aspects of SARS-CoV-2 in, uh, in rheumatology and lupus. You know, I, I just thought it would be really important to go through some of the basics of COVID-19 and, and the virus SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and one of the key things is the transmission of the virus. How is it transmitted? And I think it's never, uh, it's always good to remind people of this and uh, uh, it, 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 it's so important that, that uh, I think it's important that I, I highlight it in this presentation as well. So the virus is transmitted mainly through exposure to respiratory droplets when people are close to each other and there is one person that is infected with the virus. And by close, we usually mean um, two or less meters or approximately 60, six feet. Now, sometimes, and this is uh, not as frequent, sometimes uh, 
drop, droplets or particles can remain in the air and they remain what we call aeros aerosolized in the air. And if they are uh, uh, in the, in the, if in the air as an aerosol, uh, they can then spread over distances that are longer than two meters or six feet. Uh, so this has been reported, but is is far less common than the uh, than the, the the transmission via respiratory droplets in the context of close contact with an infected person. Even less commonly. Uh, there have been reports of, contamin uh, of uh, infection through contact with contaminated surfaces, uh, but we now know that this is also uh, 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 a large, by large, a much less common uh, cause of transmission. And interesting, the, vi the virus has, has also been found in various others, other uh, uh, biologic uh, fluids and materials, so not only respiratory secretions, but also in the stools, blood, semen, and ocular secretions. But actually the role in transmission is unknown. And as far as you know, it, it does not represent uh, a relevant mode of transmission. And uh, again, uh, it's never too much to emphasize these five golden rules, which are the golden rules for preventing are the acquisition and the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. One, the universal wearing of masks or cloth face coverings. Two, maintaining physical distance, at least two meters or six feet. Three, avoid crowds and congregate settings. Four, being outdoors is always better than being indoors, or so being indoors increases the risk of the possibility of transmitting the virus and five frequent washing of hands. And to be honest, if all these measures were really universally um, embraced, probably we wouldn't be in the current situation that we are. Um, but obviously this also requires a significant political and social intervention. And therefore it is never too much to emphasize these five golden rules. And, and this is the current state of the pandemic as of, I think, two days ago, um, with almost 60, 60 million uh, global cases reported and uh, uh, over 1.4 million, million of deaths reported worldwide. And again, before actually moving to patients with rheumatic disease and patients with lupus, I, I think it's really interesting to look at data from the general population. And, uh, and you'll understand why, uh, because a lot of the data is actually quite similar. So I'll start by showing um, a study that was performed in the UK. And this study only included hospitalized patients. So patients that had to be admitted in the hospital. It was performed in 208 acute care hospitals in England, Wales, and Scotland. And uh, the data was collected between early February and mid-April 2020. Now in total, uh, these authors collected more than 15,000 cases where almost 4,000 deaths were reported. And obviously the, the death rate here is high because we are only talking about that patients that had the disease that was severe enough to deserve hospitalization. So obviously this is a, a very selective population and selected towards uh, more severe cases. Now then the, the authors used a specific technique which is called Cox proportional hazards, but that basically uh, looks at the, 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 the association between a certain feature and the, the, the likelihood of death. It's like a risk factor. Although causality cannot immediately be inferred, therefore it is better to speak about association of a certain feature with death uh, or with the, likelihood of, like, more, the higher likelihood of, of death. Now, if you look here at the factors that were associated with COVID-19 related death, it is clear that the main factor 
is eight. So over the age of, of 80, you see a number here, which is called the hazard ratio. So the higher this number, the higher the risk of, uh, of death in the, in the specific subgroup. So the hazard ratio for patients over the age of 80 is 11 compared to 2.6 in the, in the subgroup with an age between 50 and 59 years old. So there's a clear gradient dependent on age where age uh, is associated with a higher risk of COVID-19 related fatality. Uh, male, but male, male subjects were also uh, more likely to die compared to females and, and then a wide range of, of chronic diseases, chronic cardiac disease, chronic pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes was almost statistically significant but there was also a trend there. Um, uh, overweight, chronic neurological disorders, dementia, uh, malignancy, so cancer, and moderate or severe liver disease. So age, gender, specifically uh, male, male gender, and then a wide range of comorbidities. But that was in the, in the, in the in an hospitalized population. Uh, there was another study uh, that also performed form in the UK. And, and this study used data from uh, primary care uh, health electronic record sy systems. And, and primary care records were then linked uh, at the patient level. Uh, they were linked to the COVID-19 patient notification system. Now this study uh, collected records from over 17 million adult NHS patients in the UK. And they also looked at COVID-19 related death. Um, and the time period for the data collection was between early February, 2020 and late April, 2020. And in this study, uh, almost 6,000 deaths could be attributed to COVID-19. And I show you here uh, the, the, the same type of graph that I've shown before. Uh, and again, uh, uh, it shows the various characteristics and the likelihood of death uh, when the subgroup of patients had those characteristics. So you see a number here in the X axis, you see number one. So if the bar is above one and it, if it does not cross this red line, it means that that factor is associated with a higher probability of death. And if the bar does, does not cross the red line, it means that the factor is statistically significant. If the bar crosses the red line, it means that there is a trend, but that trend is not statistically significant because the confidence interval overlaps with the unit, with the number one. So again, similar to the previous study, uh, you see that uh, age was a major factor associated with COVID-19 related uh, fatality. Uh, again, for the group above the age of eight, you see that the, the hazard ratio is uh, above 10, uh, but for example, for the age group about between 60 and 69, the, the hazard ratio is significantly lower, lower, you know, between two and three. And, and this gradient, interesting was, interesting, was also observed for obesity and for the deprivation status. Um, uh, although here, the gradient was less strong, was, was slightly weaker compared to the gradient uh, for, for age. Other factors that were uh, associated with the worst outcome were being male, similar to the previous study, Ethnic minorities, uh, so being um, uh, black of Asian, Asian uh, ethnicity or mixed race. And finally, uh, a, a wide range of comorbidities again. Diabetes, severe asthma, cancer, liver disease, kidney disease, neurological conditions, organ transplant, 
and I've highlighted two comorbidities here. One of them is RA, so rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and psoriasis. So in this study, these uh, groups of patients, which are very different, they weren't analyzed together. And indeed, there was a sm slight increased risk of fatality in these patients compared to um, the general population. It was a very low risk. So if you look here at the line, I hope you can see my, my arrow. Um, if you look here, that's the, the, the bar for patients with rheumatoid, lupus, and psoriasis. And you can see that the, 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 the hazard rate is just a little bit above one. So it's, a, it's only a small risk, uh, but it was significant. Now, I think it's important to highlight that we're not really sure what's driving the risk, which, which condition, because they were, they were analyzed together. And two, there was no adjustment for the severity of disease or for the medications that were, they were taking. So in fact, um, it's not entirely uh, clear if the risk is really attributable to the disease or some other underlying factor such as the severity of disease, organ damage, or the medication that some patients were taking. And finally, a, a, a very broad group that, this, that was included in this study called other immunosuppressive conditions. And this group is even more difficult to interpret because it can just include so many conditions that it becomes really difficult to interpret, uh, but the odds ratio there was close to two. The hazard ratio part of it. Okay, and because this is a lupus convention, I, I, you know, I, I have to mention hydroxychloroquine. Although I have to say that nowadays, I try to avoid speaking about it because I think we, uh, we have had enough of, of, of uh, issues with, with hydroxychloroquine. And I, I guess this, this, this slide uh, represents the, the hydroxychloroquine pendulum uh, over the last, you know, uh, nine to 10 months. It started with hydroxychloroquine being announced as a miracle drug for COVID-19 in the early stages of the pandemic. At certain point, uh, it, it, it was announced as a potentially deadly medication. And finally now, I, I think we've reached the balance where it is clear that hydroxychloroquine is not effective and it is a very safe and important drug that should be administered to the right patients. And the right patients are, for example, patients with this systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, and just to conclude with regards to hydroxychloroquine, there's now convincing evidence that this drug is ineffective in protecting against COVID-19 including in patients with SLE, and it is also ineffective as a treatment for COVID-19, so it should be reserved for those patients that need it, need it and where we know that the drug works. So hydroxychloroquine should be avoided for treating any stage of SARS-CoV-2 infection since it does not provide any additional benefit to the standard of care. And I hope that this is the end of the story for hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. Um, I would also like to mention an effort that was undertaken by ULAR a few months ago. And these were the first ULAR recommendations for the management of uh, rheumatic diseases in the context of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I have to say that the large majority, if not all of the, the recommendations that I will present in the next three slides, they are not evidence-based uh, recommendations. And the reason for that is because when uh, they, they were created, there was no real good evidence available to make these recommendations. Uh, but still, ULAR felt it, that it was important uh, to advise the various stakeholders, patients, uh, healthcare professionals, rheumatologists, uh, to advise about what should be done at least from an expert point of view in the context of COVID-19. 
Um, in the meantime, we've had more data that has become available and there's an odd, and this task force is now planning to update these recommendations. But I will quickly go through what uh, ULAR has proposed um, a few months ago. So ULAR created some overarching principles, which are just you know general concepts that ULAR felt they, you know, the various stakeholders should, should take into account. So when these recommendations were published, there was no evidence to suggest that patients with rheumatic diseases were more at risk of contracting the virus compared to individuals without uh, rheumatic disease. And there was also not, no data to convincingly at least suggest that patients with rheumatic diseases could have a worse outcome of COVID-19 compared to uh, individuals without a rheumatic disease. Two, um, the, the diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19 should be the responsibility of the, of the, of the, the medical team treating COVID-19, and this could include the pulmonologist, the internist, or the specialist in infectious disease. But uh, it was felt important also to highlight that the rheumatologist, as a leading expert in immunosuppressive treatment, should ideally be involved in the discussions um, about their patients, if, if possible. And also, um, uh, because this knowledge about the role of immunosuppressive treatments in COVID-19, which was, you know, uh, figured at least in part by the existence of that hyperinflammatory state that um, was described in COVID-19, it was also important to highlight that, you know, rheumatologists to make themsel themselves available uh, for, uh, for discussions about the use of immunosuppressive drugs or immunomodulatory drugs in the context of, of COVID-19. And it was also recommended that, you know, the use of all these drugs should be restricted uh, to clinical trials and that off-label use uh, should really be discouraged. And I think uh, the recent evidence uh, has shown how important this is because the majority, the large majority of treatments that were initially proposed as uh, promising treatments in, in COVID-19, um, uh, a, a big proportion has in fact failed, which just tell you how important it is to conduct appropriately powered randomized controlled trials addressing the key research questions. Uh, this was the first set of recommendations specific for patients with rheumatic diseases. The first one uh, highlights something that I've highlighted today, that patients with rheumatic diseases should be strongly advised to comply with all the preventive and control measures prescribed by the health authorities in their countries. So this relates to those five golden principles that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. Um, that that uh, patients with rheumatic diseases who do not have a, a suspected or confirmed COVID-19, they should all continue their treatments. So at this point in time, there was no indication, uh, there was no evidence to suggest that patients with rheumatic disease should stop their ongoing treatments. Uh, on the contrary, this could actually be deleterious because it could lead to a flare of the condition. Uh, and that itself um, uh, could, be, um, uh, uh, could be a factor that, uh, could determine a worse outcome if, if patients uh, eventually become uh, uh, infected by COVID-19. Although in patients with uh, stable disease, um, uh, 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 you know, the, at that point in time, there was a lot of discussion about telephone consultations versus face-to-face uh, uh, -face consultations. And it was also agreed that it was appropriate to do uh, 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 remote consultation, especially in those patients that were well controlled. Um, and if uh, uh, patients with a rheumatic disease uh, were offered uh, an outpatient daycare or other type of hospital appointment, uh, uh, you know, the, the local uh, prevention and control measures should always be followed. In terms of uh, actual actions for patients that become infected with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 
what ULAR suggested was that in patients with rheumatic diseases without COVID-19 COVID symptoms, but that had been in contact with a SARS-CoV-2 positive person, they should be tested. That, that's the, that would be the first step. Ideally, ideally any, any person that uh, becomes in contact with a, with a SARS-CoV-2 infected person, they should be tested. Uh, now, if the patient um, uh, is chronically treated with glucocorticoids, it was important to highlight, uh, the ULAR felt that it was important to highlight that this sh treatment should be continued because again, stopping the glucocorticoids uh, could uh, lead to a flare of the condition. Um, and then if for patients experience COVID-19 symptoms, if the symptoms were mild, that does not necessarily mean that uh, the drugs used to treat the rheumatic disease should be stopped. And that should uh, be discussed on a case by case basis. Uh, however, in those patients experience uh, more severe symptoms, um, it might be uh, prudent um, to, 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 to stop uh, the, the medications and to discuss at least with the, uh, the medical treat team treating COVID-19. It was also felt important to highlight that it was important that uh, the vaccination status was up to date with regards to other uh, conditions, name, namely the anti-pneumococcal uh, vaccination and the flu vaccine, because that will protect the patients for other types of infections that will continue to occur uh, together with COVID-19. And, and there was a special note for patients uh, taking high dose of glucocorticoids or cyclophosphamide and the possibility of another infection that can occur and for which prophylaxis should be considered, which is the uh, pneumocystis girovecchi infection. And finally, for the last section of my talk, I will really look into factors associated with COVID-19 in patients with rheumatic diseases. And this is mainly data from the ULAR COVID-19 database and the Global Rheumatology Alliance COVID-19 database. And the concern since the beginning of the pandemic is that because uh, our patients have underlying immune dysfunctions, they have autoimmune diseases, uh, some of them, or they have inflammatory joint diseases, because they are sometimes immunosuppressed or at least using immunomodulatory uh, drugs, because sometimes they do experience higher levels of comorbidities because we know that cardiovascular disease, for example, can be associated with uh, the inflammatory status seen in some of our conditions. And because some of our patients do have uh, 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 damage of various organs or systems like, like the kidney, for example, in patients with lupus nephritis or like the lung in patients with interstitial lung disease and, and scleroderma, which is another uh, connective tissue disorder. So potentially these patients could be at risk of, uh, of, of, of more serious COVID-19 uh, if they acquire the virus. On the other hand, uh, we had drugs that we use in rheumatology that were being studied to treat COVID-19, which was a kind of a paradox. But these drugs, you know, like interleukin-6 blockers, interleukin-1 blockers, the JAK inhibitors, glucocorticoids, hydroxychloroquine at some point, you know, they, they were being studied uh, in the context of that, uh, mainly of that uh, hyperinflammatory syndrome that characterized severe COVID-19. Uh, now, initially, there were only very small series of cases that, and, and I've listed them here, but I won't go through them because they are really not informative. It's not a series of 10, 15, 20 cases that is going to be informative. Um, and and, and the, the biggest study was actually a, a study performing patients with IBD, the biggest study until probably March, uh, no, April, March, April, uh, 2020. Um, was, was a study uh, performed by, oncology, by our gastroenterology colleagues in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, where they showed that patients on steroids um, and patients on um, a certain, uh, uh, the patients are on steroids that have comorbidities and that were older had a worse outcome of COVID-19. And they also describe uh, a bit of a strange association with sulfasalazine. 
Now, after this study was published, we published our, our studies in the, in the COVID-19 ULAR JRI database. And the first one was a report of 600 patients. And this was published in late May, 2020. And we looked at the risk of hospitalization, uh, controlling for multiple factors. So we looked at age, gender, smoking status, the rheumatic disease itself, comorbidities like hypertension, lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic kidney disease, and, the, and anti rheumatic medication pre COVID. So we look at these factors as factors that could be potentially associated with a higher probability of hospitalization. Now, these are the baseline characteristics of the study population. And it's, it's, it's a typical population of patients with rheumatic diseases. Uh, 46 of them were hospitalized and 9% uh, were deceased. Uh, and, and, and please, when you look at these figures, please note these are, these are only the cases reported to the database. And obviously there is a bias towards the more severe cases. So many of the asymptomatic cases are not reported because they, you know, at this point in time, they were, they were not even being tested because testing was not widely, widely available. And also, you know, uh, people with rheumatic disease and mild symptoms were less likely uh, to capture the attention of, or, or, uh, or the rheumatology was less likely to become aware of those cases. So obviously there is a selection bias here towards more severe cases. And that's why uh, the, the, the fatality rate is 9%, but that, that obviously does not represent the fatality rate among the entire population with rheumatic diseases. Okay, I think it's really important to highlight this, there is a bias, a reporting bias towards people that are sick enough to actually receive a COVID-19 diagnosis or even testing, although now testing is more widely available, but it wasn't a few months ago. Now, if you look at this population, uh, it, it is a typical population of patients with rheumatic diseases with the rheumatoid arthritis being the, 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 the group of patients uh, more widely represented, 38%, but lupus there second with 14%, and then spondyloarthritis and vasculitis. Um, you know, a significant percentage of patients with comorbidities, including hypertension, lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and chronic kidney disease. 22% uh, 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 were uh, current or past smokers and then a wide range of medications being used, uh, uh, conventional synthetic DMARDs, biologic drugs, anti-malarials, um, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, 33, 32% apologies, or 32% of, of apologies, 32% of the patients uh, using uh, glucocorticoids. Now this graph, uh, represents the likelihood of hospitalization, so the odds of hospitalization by comorbidity. And it's similar to the previous graph. So if this, uh, if this bar here is beyond uh, the, the dotted line and it does not cross the dotted line, which represents the odds ratio of one, which means no risk, uh, then it means that this factor is associated with the outcome, and the outcome in this case is hospitalization. So indeed, hypertension or cardiovascular disease, lung disease, diabetes, and chronic renal disease, they were all associated with a higher odds, a higher probability of the patient becoming hospitalized. This second graph represents the same type of data, so the odds of hospitalization according to diagnosis. And we can, what we can see here is that irrespective of the diagnosis, either lupus or psoriatic arthritis or axial spondyloarthritis or vasculitis, there was no increased risk of hospitalization, meaning probably that it is not the underlying condition that is determining the 
worse or better outcome, but rather other factors such as certain specific clinical or demographic factors, such as those already explored like age and comorbidities. And I did not show it here, but age was also associated with a higher probability of hospitalization. You know, very similarly, it's very similar to what has been described in the general population. I would, however, like to highlight that for lupus, uh, the, 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 the effect was almost statistically significant. So I do think that is a group where extra caution might be required, but it's also a group where is, there is more likely to be uh, confounding because of the potential for other various organs being affected and for and because of the large number of drugs and very different drugs that can be used in this condition. So at some point it becomes quite difficult to adjust for all that. But what the, these results show that is that irrespective of the condition, uh, the, the, the condition itself did not increase the odds of hospitalization. Uh, and, and this is the, the likelihood of hospitalization according to the medication that patients were taking. And again, this is very reassuring data because basically what it was showing is that none of the medications taken by our patients were associated with a worse outcome, the worst outcome here being hospitalization. And in fact, some of the medications, namely biologic drugs, particularly TNF blockers, were associated with a lower uh, risk of hospitalization. Um, and we don't know into what extent this be, could be confounding by indication, but, you know, but overall it's very reassuring data. What we could not do at this point in time is to look at individual medications because the sample size was just not big enough. So although we did look at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and hydroxychloroquine, and we do look at hydroxychloroquine at that point in time because of all the debate about it. But you know, already here we could see that it doesn't really matter hydroxychloroquine because the odds ratio is basically one. Um, so we could not look at all the individual medications. So we had to analyze them as a group, which is of course a limitation. Um, um, however, you know, with regards to corticosteroids, so glucocorticoids uh, with prednisolone dosages equal or above 10, we did see a slightly increased risk of hospitalization. And this might be because those patients taking higher doses of glucocorticoids might also be more severely affected. Uh, they may uh, affected by their, their underlying condition you know, the, the, the rheumatoid arthritis, the lupus, the systemic sclerosis, whatever. But we did see this association. Um, but that doesn't mean that glucocorticoids should be stopped or reduced. On the contrary, because if people stop it or reduce them, they may uh, have more, the disease may become, uh, may become more active. And that may be it's by itself uh, a factor of worse prognosis in COVID-19. Um, Having said this, I think it is important to use, you know, the lowest uh, corticosteroid dose possible while still controlling the disease. Uh, now, the next paper that we published looked at health disparities in people of different ethnicities uh, uh, that acquired COVID-19. And this paper was specific for patients with rheumatic diseases. It, it used data from the US only because of the, uh, the ethnic diversity there. So it was the, the most appropriate data set uh, to use um, and, and a similar type of design. So we looked at the probability, the likelihood of a worse outcome, that being either hospitalization, ventilatory support or fatality. Uh, and we looked at it depending on the race, the ethnicity of the subject. And we compared um, ethnical minorities, so being uh, uh, black, Latinx, or uh, Asian, we compared it with, with the, the white population that was used as a reference. And as I said before, this study was, was performed in the UK. Um, 
and, and we, we adjusted for the typical variables. So age, uh, gender, smoking status, the rheumatic disease, the disease activity of the underlying condition, comorbidities, and, and the medication that the, the subjects were taking. Um, and this study included 1,324 rheumatic disease uh, cases. There were some slight baseline differences depending on, on ethnicity, which also reflects um, um, some of the ethnic differences in terms of the, the conditions that are more prevalent. So for example, among, um, and among black subjects, uh, there, there were more patients with SLE uh, compared to white subjects. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, among black subjects, there were also more females. Uh, and among white people, uh, there were more patients with psoriatic arthritis. Now this slide uh, shows the COVID-19 outcomes uh, according to ethnicity. And white patients were indeed less likely to be hospitalized, so 29%, compared to black, 51%, uh, Latin Americans, 37%, Asian, 43%, and other mixed race patients, 35%. Um, so in terms of hospitalization, black and Asian individuals were threefold, uh, had a threefold higher odds of becoming hospitalized, while that odds was twofold for Latin Americans. With regards to ventilatory support, uh, Latin Americans had a threefold higher odds of being ventilated, while no differences were found for mortality based on race or ethnicity. And finally, the, the last study that we did, and this is a study that has recently been submitted for publication, so it's undergoing peer review at the moment, so this is unpublished data, but my colleague from uh, Rebecca Granger from the JRA Steering Committee did present uh, some of these data at the recent ACR 2020 meeting, and I will also present it here today. So in this study, we look at risk factors for, uh, for fatality in the JRA ULAR COVID-19 registry. It included cases collected up to the 1st of July, 2020. The main outcome, as I mentioned, was death. And we, we looked at the usual exposures that uh, I've mentioned for, for the previous studies. Now the study included 3,729 patients, 62% of them from Europe and 29.6% uh, from North America. In this cohort, the fatality rate was 10.5%. Uh, and you can already see here uh, that, uh, oh, and, the, and the, the proportion of, of patients, you know, among those diseases, they were of course more likely to be ventilated or hospitalized. So 97% of the patients that died were, had been hospitalized um, with a small percentage of probably dying in, in care homes, for example, and, uh, and almost 41% of those diseases uh, and also required uh, invasive ventilation. Okay, so finally I'll present the same type of graph that I've been presenting so far, uh, and again with the same type of organization. So the first graph is the, the risk, the odds ratio uh, for fatality uh, based on demographic, uh, uh, based on demographic features. Sorry, there's a typo there. This should be by demographic characteristics uh, and or clinical features. Now you, you have four bars here. The black bar represents the entire population. So all patients irrespective of the condition. So RA plus lupus plus vasculitis plus arthritis plus myositis. Uh, now the, the red bar is an analysis restricted to those patients with inflammatory joint diseases. So those would be the patients mainly with RA and spondyloarthritis. The yellow bar is the group of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And finally, the blue bar 
other patients with connective tissue diseases and vasculitis. And the majority of these patients have lupus. So probably the blue bar is the one that would be of most interest to this audience because all the lupus patients are included there. Now, COVID-19 uh, related fatality was associated with age, again, very consistent in the general population and also in the population with rheumatic diseases. Male gender, again, very consistent with data from the general population. Um, smoking was, only, was an association that was only observed in the rheumatoid arthritis population and moderate high disease activity was a, a risk factor across all populations. And I think this finding is really, really, really important because what it, what it is telling us is that if the disease is not well controlled, patients are more likely to uh, die from COVID-19. So it is really important, even in the context of a, this pandemic, that the disease activity is controlled. And that might be more important than any medication that the patient might be taking. Uh, in terms of uh, medications, um, COVID-19 fatality uh, uh, was associated with, uh, so apologies, this graph is incorrect. So in terms of uh, comorbidities, Again, COVID-19 uh, fatality was associated with cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular disease plus hypertension and lung disease, uh, and uh, uh, also chronic kidney disease in the group with uh, connective tissue disorders and, and vasculitis. So this group includes the patients with systemic lupus. Uh, in terms of the medications, um, what we observed was that uh, for the majority of drugs, uh, so drugs like anti-malarials, uh, drugs like uh, uh, leflunomide, uh, 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 TNF inhibitors, abatacept, belimumab, interleukin-6 inhibitors, uh, and uh, interleukin-17, 23, and 12 inhibitors, they were not associated with a worse outcome which is very similar data to the data that we had previously reported in hospitalized patients. Now, we did find uh, an association with the worst outcome in patients taking sulfasalazine, rituximab, and higher doses of glucocorticoids. So higher dose of glucocorticoids we already discussed. Uh, the new finding is with regards to rituximab and sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine is very difficult to explain uh, because it's usually considered to be a less immunosuppressive medication. It's mainly used in patients either with RA or spondyloarthritis, but there is some data to suggest that it may alter the response, the antiviral response, and it, has, it is an association that it has been reported also in the uh, inflammatory bowel disease registry. With regards to rituximab, um, it's probably not surprising that we're seeing this. It is a concern that we have had for quite a long time, because as you know, rituximab it depletes B cells. So it interferes with antibody production. So potentially, uh, patients on rituximab could have a decreased or impaired antiviral response. Um, uh, but again, you know, this does not show causality and it needs, and this data needs to be very well balanced uh, with the, the need to control the disease, the need to control disease activity and to protect the patients against, against organ damage. Um, and this state is currently being discussed. Um, uh, one possibility is that in the future, we might consider other alternatives to rituximab if they're, if they're available. Um, uh, but these are, as I said, preliminary data, and I think they still need to be discussed further uh, uh, among the scientific community. <clears throat> 
And finally, I'll just like to show you the current status of the, the database. We now have almost 7,000 patients in the, in the database, 3,572 reported to the global database, and 3,239 reported to the ULAR registry. And you know, it is really important that colleagues continue to report cases. And I'd like to thank the entire rheumatology community for their contribution and also the national societies that have contributed as a whole. And to conclude, uh, I've shown you that risk factors for hospitalization death among people with rheumatic diseases is largely similar to those with a, without rheumatic diseases. So the factors that are more often associated with the worst outcome are, are age, male gender, and the presence of comorbidities. It's really important to control disease activity, activity because remission and low disease activity have been associated with a reduced odds of hospitalization and the reduced odds of, uh, of death. Uh, uh, I think it's important to minimize glucocorticoids uh, while uh, you know, still administering the required dosages to control the disease. And let's wait for the publication of the combined registry data so that uh, there can be further discussion about the potential risk of rituximab and sulfasalazine. And given the, 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 the disparities that have been described among different ethnic populations, I also think that it is important to advocate for measures that protect racial and ethnic minorities by giving them a uh, giving uh, the, these people uh, uh, relevant, relevant information, uh, namely about to reduce the risk of infection and about testing. And just a final word, again, to, to thank all the national societies and the colleagues reporting cases to the ULAR COVID-19 database, the ULAR staff, the technical team that supports the database, my colleagues from the ULAR COVID-19 database steering committee, and my colleagues from the, the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance Steering Committee. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. And fortunately, it supports what we have found ourselves and told our members, so that's good. Um, I'm sure you all have a lot of questions and we are many people here. So I would like you guys yeah. to either write in the chat box and we'll try to read them out loud or Put, raise your hand because then we'll get you one by one. I've been trying to follow what's going on in the chat box. So I'm going to start with the ones I already saw. Um, so we had <clears throat> Alain who asked, how do we explain the link between black ethnicity but with so, such a low rate in Africa compared to Europe? Uh, so um, Africa, you cannot directly compare it to Europe in the sense that it, there are completely different geographic circumstances. Uh, the population density is far less than in the majority of European countries. So people are not in, 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 in close contact as much as they are in Western countries than Europe mm -hmm. and in the US. Yeah. Uh, and obviously that uh, decreases the transmission. But I also think it's important to bear in mind uh, that people are not being as tested probably as they are in Europe yes. and the US. That's what I've been thinking, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so both factors need to be taken into account. And, and those, these two factors per se, I think would be enough to explain the differences. Yeah, probably. And there are probably even more factors related to uh, healthcare provision um, and many other social uh, economical factors. Thank you. So Wendy, maybe you would like to unmute yourself and ask the next question about smoking. Yeah, I saw in one of the first um, uh, pictures, I saw that when you were a, a smoker before, but stopped, you were worse off, then you're still when you're still a smoker, and that puzzled me. One of yeah. the first uh, graphs. Uh, 
Yeah, that's that's entirely true. It's uh, with regards to smoking, there have been uh, contradictory results published in the literature, and uh, I don't think we have a definite answer with regards to smoking. The issue is that often smoking is uh, correlated with other with various comorbidities, with lung disease, with cardiovascular disease, and we don't know in to what extent those analyses that was taken into account, it might be an intermediate factor uh, or a, a, a confounder rather than a true association, which would, depending on the type of analysis that was done, uh, uh, the, the results could be different. Yeah. So at the moment, I don't think we have enough and robust data to convincingly tell us if smoking is a risk factor or, or not. Yeah, if you uh, didn't stop smoking after such a long period, uh, you must be very healthy, so you survive. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and the other thing, reason, right? <laughs> yeah, and the other thing often it's what's reported is a uh, current smoker uh, versus a never smoker or previous smoker. Uh, and often there's a lot of recall bias as well. And this does not take into account the amount of smoking that can and only be taken into account if you calculate the number of packs of cigarettes per year. Um, so there are a lot of nuances in those type of analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Alain, you've been busy. Uh, do we have an idea of how much additional caution I guess I've removed this, otherwise I can't read it. Uh, due to the complexity of the disease drives the additional hospitalization. Maybe Alain, uh, you complexity can Alain, can you unmute yourself and ask it in the right way? Yes, yes. So the question was, we are looking at uh, hospitalization based on some diseases, but maybe when a patient is less sick, you already hospitalize with some of these diseases. You kind of say, ooh, this is already a difficult patient normally. So with COVID, maybe the hospitalization threshold is lower. Do we have any idea of the difference maybe that plays there that you assess a risk factor upfront higher for some diseases and therefore you drive hospitalizations up? Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think, you know, you are right that if we become aware of a patient that has COVID and has multiple comorbidities, one might be more likely to admit that patient. Uh, having, having said this, um, especially at the, the peak of the pandemic, and there have been various peaks, mm -hmm. uh, the admissions had to be mainly driven by the you know, by the severity of, of the symptoms. So even, so even if the patient had multiple comorbidities, but he was doing all from a symptomatic point of view, um, I, don't, I don't think that that patient would be necessarily admitted because there was a lot of pressure um, uh, on, on the hospitals. And, but then that has varied over time as well. And the other thing, I think over time, we, we now know much better how to manage patients with COVID-19. And, uh, and obviously I think the outcomes have improved just, you know, just over time, just because from a medical point of view, we've learned how to deal with this, with this patient, the population better. So I agree, uh, those factors are something that is potentially confounding the results. But that's why it is so important to have large sample size and, and a wide representative uh, sample of the population. And I think now with the current numbers, we're starting to have that, but that's also why I always encourage my colleagues to report those patients with asymptomatic infection, with mild infection that stayed at home might have uh, uh, probably became aware that they have COVID. Uh, and and I'm, I'm now starting to see those patients in clinic, you know, uh, patients that, oh, and by the way, I did have COVID like two months ago. I had symptoms, I got tested and it was positive. I stayed at home, but I was fine. And, but those patients are very important to report 
because then we have a, we'll have a consolidated data database that is really representative of the entire population and that will allow us to do more and better and more robust and better analysis. Thank you. Um, we had, Daniela had a question about bilimumab. I think it was a clarification uh, of if, the, if, was, if there was a bigger risk if you use bilimumab or not. I guess the answer is no, right, from your, from your slides. Is there anything yes. else you can say about bilimumab? Yeah, in, 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 in our analysis, we didn't see a, a negative signal for, for belimumab. Mm -hmm. um, having said this, the number of patients on belimumab was, was small, which is a, a caveat in that analysis, but we didn't see that, that association. And the other thing, although belimumab obviously interferes with, with B cells, it's, it's very different from dituximab uh, because it's not a B cell depleter, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the mechanism of action is different. So I don't think the rituximab results should be compared with belimumab. That's why, also why we analyzed two medications separately and the signal that we saw for rituximab, we did not see it for belimumab. That's good to know. A lot of us take belimumab, so that's great news, thank you. Um, then Amy had a question. If COVID causes this hyper-inflammatory hyper response, would being on immune suppressants prevent this from happening? And I think you more or less answered it, but <laughs> yeah. It just uh, <laughs> so it's only in a minor, in a subgroup of patients that it, this happens. You know, you shouldn't think that this happens in the majority of patients. It doesn't. It's a, it's a really a minority of patients, and that has been the underlying hypothesis, in fact, for uh, uh, for testing so many immunomodulatory drugs in, in COVID nineteen. Um, having said this, I have to say that the majority of the trials have failed. Um, and the ones that have been positive so far, so it, it's, it were the trials with steroids and, uh, and the evidence is stronger for dexamethasone. And that was the recovery trial. There are a couple of more um, and uh, with other, other steroids, but the strongest evidence is for dexamethasone. But the evidence is only, it's only for those patients uh, that required high flow oxygen or that were ventilated. So in patients that did not require oxygen or that were not ventilated, there was no benefit from dexamethasone, okay? And in fact, there was a trend for a worse outcome if you look at the data in detail, although it was not statistically significant. Mm. So dexamethasone and then the other positive uh, data was recently published with baracitinib, which is a JAK inhibitor, mm -hmm. uh, and and this was a, a uh, it, this was a, actually a press release. I don't think the trial has been published. It should be published in the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, but it's also important to note that this trial was done again in patients with severe disease. Uh, patients that will require uh, uh, mechanical ventilation or extracorporeal oxygenation or um, uh, that were in ITUs. Uh, and paracetinib was given in association with an antiviral drug called remdesivir. Okay, mm -hmm. so again, uh, positive, but in a very selected population. Yeah. And then there is tocilizumab, which is a interleukin-6 blocker and there's conflicting evidence there with some positive trials and negative trials. It's difficult to compare the trials because the populations are quite different. The severity of the populations that were included in the trials are quite different. I think the jury is still out there for tocilizumab. I don't think we have a definite answer with regards to the potential value of, of, of um, uh, tocilizumab in COVID-19. But that's it, all the other studies that have been published so far have in fact been, been negative. So I, I think potentially, yes, immunomodulators and immunosuppressives may be, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they will be protective. <laughs> I think they may be useful in a very selective proportion of cases. And this will be the cases with more severe disease, um, ventilated on oxygen, with hyperinflammation, and again, it won't be all immunomodulators. It will be maybe two or three 
and that's that's what we need to understand better. Yeah, so you always I always have to be careful when looking at results like this. I know. Um, so Alicia, I think we already answered this, but uh, she's writing only pregnancy alone has been associated with higher odds of hospitalization. What about other types of treatment? So, uh, we, we, so that was glucocorticoids as a whole. So what we did, uh, because depending on the glucocorticoid, the meaning of the dose is different, and and they have we can calc calculate the prednisolone equivalent dose. So that's what we calculated. So if patients were using the flazacort or you know any other corticosteroid, we converted the dose to the prednisolone equivalent dose, okay? So that, that, that those results apply to all steroids and the cutoff for a worse outcome was uh, 10 milligrams per day. Yes, thank you. Then um, Kika has a question about vaccines. I guess this is a new topic. Um, is there a risk of the RNA vaccine to us with lupus? I don't know if you have any idea yeah. about this, but <laughs> so now that's a very trendy topic, as you can imagine. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but also a very difficult one. Um, and, and and the reason is that you, we don't have the data to answer the, the, the questions. Uh, now, if the question is, you know, is the RNA vaccine or any other type of vaccine uh, dangerous to patients with with lupus? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I, you know, there are many other, you know, uh, I, or I don't, you know, there's no reason to believe that uh, patients with lupus will be a risk of a severe advance from the vaccine compared to other, other patients. Um, there are other more complicated issues with, with vaccines that have to do with uh, the antibody response uh, in patients that are receiving certain medications, for example. Uh, or patients with underlying immune dysfunction. Um, uh, but I think but that's another story. And it's again, it's something that we don't have the data yet, but it's something that we are thinking about carefully. And, and that's something that the ULR task force for the management of rheumatic diseases will also address in the future. Yeah, thank you. We're looking forward to learning more about that when we get more results. So, Boriana asks, are there any differences in mortality rate if we talk about different areas of Europe? Yeah, sorry if I missed any information. Um, yeah, different areas of Europe. Do you know if there's any difference from country to country or area, south, yeah. north, west? So we, so we have that data from the, from the ULAR database and from the global database. Um, but I, and, and in fact, for example, we saw that uh, there was a higher rate of fatality in, in patients from the UK. Um, um, now, I don't think this database is the most suitable one to look at that because of the potential for selection bias and yes. the method of data collection was quite different. Um, so although we do see some differences, I don't think we should really conclude anything from those differences because the database was really not created to uh, deal with that question. For that question, you really need populational level data. You really need to be sure that you're cap capturing all the cases or a really representative sample of, of, of your population. Other, otherwise, the results uh, it will hardly be a, a correct estimation of, of the true death rates. Um, so we don't have that data in rheumatic disease, I think, at least from a, a reliable way. What the database is appropriate to is to do what we did, which is look at factors associated with the worst outcome. That is fine. That's what the database is able to answer, but is not able to answer that specific question. Okay. So Brianna says thank you. And she has a raised hand. Oriana, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I, thank you for the answer. Uh, my question was connected with different health system in different countries because I'm coming from Bulgaria, which is an Eastern uh, European country. And uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about uh, if there is high mortality in Eastern European countries or Western, uh, I mean, connected with the health systems. But yeah, I understood 
uh, what you said that it's not the right database. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Boriana. So Alan has, I don't know, I think we're going to Anne first. Um, she's wondering if blood type was taken into account as a risk factor. She believes that there's been some serious tests that suggest that it might be. Yeah, so it was not taken into account because we did not have that information. Uh, and it is correct that there have been some reports looking at that. Uh, I don't think, uh, I haven't reviewed that literature in detail. From what I recall, I don't think that literature is completely consistent. And I certainly don't think that is a prominent risk factor. But I confess that I don't know all the literature around blood type and risk of COVID-19. Okay, thank you. So I believe we have a few questions from Facebook. Zoe, could you uh, read some of the questions? Yes, hello. Um, we do have a few questions from Facebook. One is, um, I guess, is it still too early to make a recommendation for a specific type of COVID vaccine, mRNA versus classical? Yeah, it's definitely too early. Okay, so we've had the preliminary results from the, the, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the, and the, the Oxford one. Um, you know, they are preliminary results. We could debate a lot about those results, There's the, but I, it's too early to say anything about that. Okay, and we have one more question that says, are you aware of possible correlations between neurodevelopmental S SLE or neuro neuromental SLE and antidepressive antipsychotic medication and COVID hospitalization? Uh, no, I am not aware of any data reporting that type of association. Thank you. Those are the questions from Facebook. Actually, Kikas always also added one. Uh, do I refuse sure. my rituximab infusion due to next week? So no. I guess she already said that. Yes, no. <laughs> Keep taking your medication as prescribed. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. And as I said, uh, although we did find this uh, association, I think more important than that is having the disease controlled. Yes. And if the rituximab is controlling the disease, you should take it. Please take it. Okay. Uh, you know, in the future, you know, if there are there is an alternative drug that we know could be equally effective. There could be a discussion with the treating physician about potentially switching, but I think it's too early for that. And, and it's critical that patients continue taking their medication to treat their condition. They should not stop it. Stopping will lead to a flare and having a flare is probably more detrimental than any medication that they're currently taking. Thank you. So Susan has a question. Those with long COVID seem to have similar symptoms to people with lupus. For instance, it's ex excessive fatigue. Is it likely that the underlying mechanisms may be the same? And if so, that treatments may be found that will help lupus fatigue too. Interesting. It is and a very complex topic. We don't know yet. Uh, fatigue by itself is multifactorial, uh, depending on social factors, demographic factors, uh, neurocognitive factors. Uh, there's a lot of research about it. Uh, we don't understand it well yet, I think. Um, I, 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 I agree in the sense that if treatments for fatigue are found in a certain condition, they could be applicable to other conditions because I do think that there could be some shared mechanisms. Okay, mm. the question was that, yes, potentially yes. Uh, uh, but first we need the, the evidence for those mechanisms. Yes, of course, but like with every, every other medication. Yeah. Yes. So I think this is the last question. How can we help you in continuing the study? So what can we do? Well, you can advocate, you can speak with your rheumatologist, with your treatment physician and remind him or her the, to please include your case in the database if you become aware that you got COVID, uh, you, that you've, that you've have a positive swab or that you have a positive antibody test, 
you know, even if your doctor doesn't ask, remind your doctor and please include me in the ULAR database because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want my case there. I want to contribute to the database. Yeah. And then I have a question. How can we follow what you're doing? So when will you publish something? Where will you publish something? The sources? So, okay. Uh, the, the, there's the ULAR web database webpage. So if you Google ULAR COVID-19 database, it, it should be one of the first hits. Um, so there you will find, initially we actually add weekly reports, uh, database reports with, a, with an infographics to make it easier to read for the general population. Now we do it less frequently because it doesn't justify, we do it, uh, we do monthly updates. And obviously those are not um, complex analysis, it's just the description of, you know, how many patients are with each condition, the, the main symptoms, main medications, but it will give you an idea about the current status of the database. Um, and we will also post there uh, our more our papers, and we will also post a lay version of the paper. So for the first paper we published, there's our, the link is all, for, to the paper is already there, as well as a link for the lay, uh, lay summary of the paper. And we are planning to do the same when this second paper that is under review is published. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Machado, and everyone else for your great questions. We had a good discussion, I think. Um, so I know I learned a lot. I hope you guys did too. And um, before we end the session, we would like to know if we could get your feedback. Jeanette, can I? Yep. Can, I, can I answer one last question that I saw course, here that actually is actually important? Only people with a positive confirmed test can be included. Actually, no. Even if it's a presumptive case, for example, if they were in contact with someone known to have COVID, uh, those cases should also, also be included. Uh, because then what we do is do, we do a sensitivity analysis removing those cases. So those cases can also be included. Apologies. Right. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was a good question. And thank you for answering it. So coming back to, we have a small poll of the evalu an evaluation of this session. So if you could please it, it, it put in your answer um, because we use that to, to find out if this was of any use, <laughs> but I'm sure it was. <laughs> I don't know if you can give me an estimate of when you have enough answers. Otherwise, I would say thank you. To, uh, still coming in. The answers are still coming in. So Good. please keep keep everybody you give your assessment. Yeah. So okay. <laughs> 33. Uh, while you're voting, I would just like to say we would like to invite you all to join us again tomorrow, tomorrow morning, 10:30 a.m. CET time for the official opening of our convention and a review of our year and the plans for the next year. So uh, finish voting and see you then. And so here are the results. So pretty good. I mean, 94% fully agree. So thank you very, very much for that. <laughs> yes, thank you. It shows that you are really, really great. So thank you very much, Dr. Machado. Thank you for the invitation. It was a real You're pleasure. Most welcome. Here it is. For the uh, Lupus Europe PAN members who are still online, remember that we have a meeting in three minutes. You should have the link in your emails. Okay, I'll, I'll say goodbye now, okay? Yes, Take yes. care, everyone. Bye. Take bye, care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Jeanette? Jeanette, I have a yes. question. Yes. Um, I think uh, the next uh, session uh, I'm not participating, right? I am yes, that's right. Yes, so yes. just checking. So see you.